Good morning. It's nice to see you this morning. It's nice to be able to have the opportunity to worship with you this morning. If you have your Bible with you, let's go to the book of Isaiah. We are going to be in Isaiah chapter 9 this morning. If you do not have a Bible with you and you would like to follow along with us, there are Bibles that are in the chair racks in front of you. And if you don't know where to find things in the Bible, we are going to be on page 573 of the Bibles that are there in the chair racks in Isaiah 9. Before we get started on the things that I'd like for us to talk together about today, I've got a few uh, things that I want to make you aware of. Uh, the first, which you may have already heard about, is uh, the fact that we have the, uh, the joyful opportunity of celebrating with the Pets family. David and Julie Pets had their baby uh, this week uh, and uh, yesterday, and so we are rejoicing with them, and there's going to be opportunities to serve them with a meal train and su- provide any support that we can, uh, but I just wanted to, to mention that as a joyful thing that has happened in our church family over the course of this past week. Uh, The other two things are related to a couple of things that are in our near future. Uh, This Sunday or next will be our last Sunday here in this auditorium. And so uh, for those of you particularly who uh, uh, have been here uh, at our church for a long time, uh, I want to make sure that you take the opportunity to look around and remember uh, the many good things uh, that have happened here. Um, There have been many good things that have happened here. You have, uh, far before I even came on the scene, have cried together here, laughed together here, learned together here. There are all sorts of things, all sorts of monumental things that have happened in this, uh, this space right here. And so I want you to remember those things as we anticipate moving either next Sunday or the Sunday after it into our new auditorium. I want you to, to make sure that you uh, have a chance to walk out uh, for the last time and be aware of what you're doing. The other thing that I wanted to make you aware of is, uh, is to remind you that uh, on the 22nd, we are having our Christmas Eve service, which is obviously not on Christmas Eve, which is why we are calling it, "'Twas the night before, the night before, the night before Christmas." And I want you to know that we have made up some little invitation cards for that. We haven't made a ton of them, uh, but there are invitation cards that have the graphic on the front, the information on the back. It's going to be at uh, 6.30 on December 22nd, uh, Lord willing, in our new auditorium. And I would like to encourage you to stop by the information desk on your way out and, and grab one of those. And I'd like to encourage you to think, is there one person... One family that I can invite to, it was the night before, the night before, the night before Christmas. You don't have to say it like that when you invite them. In fact, you probably shouldn't. Uh, But I would love it, we would love it, if you would grab a card and just invite one person, one family to that. Uh, It's going to be a great night together. We'll be ending like we always do with a candlelight ceremony The gospel will be preached, so if you bring that unsaved family member or that unsaved neighbor, uh, we can guarantee that they will hear the gospel read in the scriptures, sung in the singing, and of course, preached that night. Okay, those are my announcements. You are patiently waiting in Isaiah 9, and so let's get to it there in Isaiah 9. Earlier this year on February 24th, Uh, Many of you will remember and know that Russia invaded Ukraine. There were uh, areas uh, that were heavily populated with citizens that immediately started being bombed. And it seems like there there was a, a rush of information, a rush of interest in that, especially in the opening weeks and months that that happened. And like anything else, we get... We get fatigued with that sort of news, and the conflict continues, and yet it starts to fall backwards in our mental awareness of, of what's going on. But that, that conflict is still raging, and there are people that are still losing their lives in that, con- in that conflict on a daily basis. It estimates about the, the casualties that have been incurred in this conflict 
are kind of hard to come by because neither side is, is totally forthcoming on, on their losses. But the UN estimates that there are roughly 200,000 soldiers, military personnel between the two sides who have lost their lives in this conflict. On top of the at least 200,000 uh, military personnel who have lost their lives, there are estimates that there are at least 40,000 uh, Ukrainian civilians who have lost their lives as their, their homes and their cities have been bombed. Then on top of that, there are people who maybe have not lost their lives in this conflict, but the UN again estimates that 7.8 million Ukrainians have fled the borders of Ukraine and have made their way into Europe. And you can imagine the way some of these people are fleeing for their lives with, with not much but the clothes on their back depending on the kindness of strangers in other countries to take them in. And on top of the 7.8 million who have been able to flee the borders, they, there are estimates that there are at least that many in the country who have been displaced but do not have the means or ability to actually leave. And so they have simply had to flee to places where their, their uh, lives are at least less in danger. Now, I would suspect that the vast majority of us do not know what it's like to live under the threat of constant enemy attack. The fear that, that a shell could at any moment hit your home and destroy it or, or, or hit your home and kill you or the people that you love. Most of us have, have never felt what it's like to be in that sort of state. Most of us has prob- have probably never lived in a state of constant stress as we fear for our lives. Most of us have never had to wonder, as even though it seems like we've repelled the attacks of the enemy, the war is dragging on and on and on. And, and as it escalates, what's going to happen? Are we ultimately going to prevail? I'm sure that the Ukrainian people have, have sometimes fantasized if only there was, there was a hero to step forward. And if that hero could step forward, could obtain a decisive military victory for us so that we no longer have to live in fear, so that we no longer have to live fearing for our safety, for our homes, for our lives. They've had, they've had leaders step forward who have led their country admirably, but, but what if I, a hero could come and, and just fix things? This is very much the situation that God's people found themselves in the prophet Isaiah's day. The northern kingdom of Israel, remember the the kingdom of Israel had been divided after Solomon's reign into the northern and southern kingdoms that are now at odds with each other. The northern kingdom had, had created an alliance with the nation of Syria and they too, and that alliance had a desire to attack the southern kingdom and to subjugate the southern kingdom. Ahaz was the king of that southern kingdom, and in spite of God's assurances to him through the prophet Isaiah that this alliance was not going to succeed, Ahaz was scared. Ahaz was trying to find a way forward. Ahaz was hoping that perhaps he, or perhaps he could ink a deal with the, with the growing superpower of Assyria, and that king would be their hero, that king would be their champion to defeat their enemies and provide a, a period of stability and safety once again to the land. It is into this situation where they are fearing for their lives that the prophet Isaiah comes in and speaks a word from the Lord. And he speaks a word from the Lord in the form of a prophetic poem. And that prophetic poem found in Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2 to 7 speaks into this situation and it promises the birth of a child. 
a child who is one day going to become a king. And, and we know that, that, that Isaiah was not speaking of a coming child, a coming king, who would enter into this particular historical moment. But we know that he was not speaking of any ordinary king. And we know that he was not speaking of any ordinary king because this prophetic poem that he speaks, a word from the Lord to Ahaz and the people into the situation, describes this coming child who would be king with four titles, four phrases that we're looking at on a weekly basis. Those are found in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. If you're there, look at it with me. The words will be on the screen behind me. But the word of God says this in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, For to us a child is born. Remember, he's speaking prophetically, looking forward. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Last week, we looked at that first title that he's given, Wonderful Counselor, and we saw that this coming child, this coming king, the Messiah, would be a divine advisor who would chart a way forward to his coming kingdom. But this week, we're going to look at the next name in Isaiah's descriptions of this coming child, and that name is this, Mighty God. Mighty God. Now, here we have this Hebrew word mighty preceding the word for God. And so it's being used as an adjective. If you want to go back to your school days, it's being used as as a word. If you forget what an adjective is, an adjective is a word that describes another word. But this Hebrew word can also stand alone as, as a noun rather than being a descriptor. It can stand on its own. And when that word stands on its own, it's often translated in your Old Testament as hero or champion. Hero or champion. When it's used to describe something, when it's used as an adjective, it's translated as Mighty, and this this word, mighty, is used to describe a variety of merely human people throughout the Old Testament. So it's, it's not an adjective, it's not a descriptive word that's reserved solely for God. However, we know that this is no ordinary hero, that this is no ordinary champion. And we know this in part... Uh, because in the very next chapter, Isaiah is going to, to, to speak a word of promise about the destiny of God's people who are going to go into captivity. So one of the things that Isaiah tells the people, one of the, the burdens that he bears as a messenger from God is telling the people that, that eventually they are, because of their sin, going to be taken into captivity. They are going to be taken off into distant lands and resettled elsewhere. They're going to be ripped from everything familiar from them and forcibly moved. But Isaiah also prophesies what's going to happen after that in chapter 10 and verse 21. He says this, A remnant will return. The remnant of Jacob to the what? To the mighty God. What Isaiah is promising here is that the mighty God, Yahweh, Jehovah, is going to bring a remnant of his people back from captivity into the land. And we can't miss this point about the deity of the child who's going to be king The Bible is connecting, the New Testament and the Old are connecting this child, the Messiah, Jesus, with the mighty God who accomplishes the mighty acts in the Old Testament. And so we know that this child who is going to be born in a manger, this son who would one day be given, is not going to be even an extraordinary human, though he is going to be fully human. Yes, he will be fully human, but he is going to be mighty God himself. Here's what Isaiah is doing. He's, 
He's, he's speaking into the longing of the nation for a champion. He's speaking into the longing of the nation for a hero. And he is saying, without, without question, there is a champion. There is a hero who will come. But what is this hero, what is this champion going to accomplish? Or... Since it's Christmas time, we could ask it a different way. What are some of the gifts that are promised from the mighty God when he comes and he sets up his reign? What is that going to look like? What are some of the gifts that he is going to deliver? And our text actually gives us a sampling of those gifts in verses 3, 4, And And so I want us to skip back a couple verses and look at three gifts that are promised from the mighty God who will come. The first gift that's promised in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 3 is the gift of joy. Look with me at verse 3. Once again, Isaiah is speaking prophetically forward. And he says this, he says, you have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. What Isaiah is saying is that when this child champion is born, one of the gifts that he is going to deliver to his people is the gift of joy. He is going to increase the joy of his people here. And there's a couple of word pictures used to describe it. It's going to be the kind of joy that you experience when you finally reach the end of a, of a, of a season of growing and you have a full and bountiful harvest. Okay, that's a metaphor for us that's difficult for us to identify with because most of us are, are not living uh, close to the land. We're not living uh, in an agrarian society. And so the harvest for us is going to our supermarket of choice where if you're willing to pay for it, you can get just about anything in the world. Everything is always in season and you can always have it. Okay, but in an agrarian society where the harvest time comes, this is... This is a joyful time because we have made it through another season. We have food that is going to take care of us into the next. And so that would be a time of rejoicing and a time of joy. When a nation tried to conquer you and you were able to overcome that attempt to conquer you, you got to keep their stuff. And that's called dividing the spoil. And so what Isaiah is looking forward to is a time when this child champion is going to bring joy, the kind of joy that comes when a victory has been won or a harvest has been made and is full. There's a second gift that this child champion, our mighty God, promises, and that's found in verse 4. It's the the gift of deliverance. Look at verse 4. It says, for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the days of Midian. There are three indicators of oppression here in the verse that I just read. There is the yoke, and we're not talking about eggs here. We're talking about, we're talking about a, a, a often wooden harness that would be placed on the back of a couple of animals that would allow those animals to, to pull a, a plow or a cart. It's indicating, it's indicating a burden that is laid on shoulders. There is the, there is the, the, uh, the staff. There is the rod of oppression. And so he refers to a yoke, a staff, and a rod as, as symbols of the oppression that his people have felt at various times. And then he calls to mind two great acts of deliverance in their history that are going to be surpassed by the act of deliverance that the mighty God accomplishes for them. He speaks, uh, he speaks evokes with the language that he uses here of their deliverance from Egypt. Uh, the, the Old Testament uses the language of the rod and the staff to speak of the way Egypt had God's people under its thumb. 
And so that language is evoking their deliverance from Egypt. And then he evokes the, the victory that Gideon wins at Midian when the people are once again find themselves under the thumb of another nation and God uses a man like Gideon to deliver those people. And so one of the gifts that the mighty God, this child champion, is going to give to his people is that of deliverance. No longer are they going to be oppressed. There's a third gift promised. From the mighty God that's found in the next verse, verse 5. Look there. It says, For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment cold in blood, will be burned as fuel for the fire. Now, what Isaiah is doing here is expressing an idea in highly poetic fashion. The imagery here that he's evoking for us is the imagery of a combat uniform. If we were to use, we were to translate that imagery into into today's language, we would be talking about a person's combat boots, their their helmet, their fatigues, and oftentimes in in the heat of battle, those those boots become caked in mud. Those Battle fatigues become splattered in blood. And the imagery that he is giving here is that those blood-stained boots boots and those battle fatigues have been cast aside. And they have been cast aside. They have been rolled up and cast aside because they are no longer needed. And there's an argument here from the lesser to the greater. If you don't need your boots, you don't need your weapons. If you don't need the uniform of war, you don't need the weapons of war because you are living in a time of safety. You are living in a time of peace. And so in this imagery, he is saying these blood-soaked boots, these garments are going to be good for nothing but to be rolled up and used as fuel for the fire because they will be living in a time of peace that the mighty God is going to bring about. You can imagine why this would have been particularly encouraging to people in Ahaz's time because they are doing anything but rolling up the garments of war and casting them into the fire. They're going into overdrive producing weapons to protect themselves, calling people, conscripting them into battle, paying other nations to join them in the fight. So to speak of a time when those things are, are, are so unneeded that they can be burned would be a word of hope. The mighty God, the child champion, hero, would one day bring safety to his people, a safety that is so permanent that the clothing of war would become forever unnecessary. This is the word from the Lord, that Isaiah speaks into this situation. One of the things you'll notice as you read through the New Testament is that Jesus often disappointed people. We think of all the miracles that Jesus did and all the wonderful things that he did, and he certainly did all of those things, but Jesus constantly disappointed people. And one of the reasons Jesus disappointed people is because the the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, was front-loaded with messianic promises like these. You know, I think sometimes we're a little bit hard on them. They wanted Jesus to come and do what Jesus had not yet come to do. They want him to set up his kingdom on earth. They're, They're saying, okay, Where's our joy? Where's our deliverance? Where's our safety? You can see why Jesus, in some respects, would have been a disappointment. Because the longer his ministry goes on, the more he does, the more it seems like the the religious leaders become polarized against him, the more dangerous it is to be a follower of Jesus. It seems like he can't be the Messiah because we're going in the wrong direction here. That child champion is going to create some stuff that Jesus ain't creating. And Jesus disappointed a lot of people because of that. But I want us to see now that that 
that there is both a future, still future fulfillment coming of this, as well as a present fulfillment of these gifts. And I want to look at them briefly, but the book of Revelation speaks and uses language that reminds us as we are, are in the time between the Advents. Remember the word Advent means coming. When we're celebrating Advent, we're celebrating the coming of Christ. And we recognize as Christian people, as followers of Jesus, that we live in a time between the Advents. Meaning Jesus has come and yet he is coming again. The song Joy to the World that we sung together, that we, we sung together, uh, whatever. We, we sang it together this morning. And when we did that, we were looking at some of the conditions that are coming at the second advent, which is yet future. So we're living in a time between the advents. But the New Testament, the Bible, and God himself has not lost track of these promises, these gifts that are coming. And Revelation proves it to us. So what I want to do is walk briefly back through these gifts and point out what Revelation has to say about their future fulfillment. First, the gift of joy that the champion child is going to bring. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7 says this, Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. What this passage is reminding us is that there is going to be a day when all conflict has ceased and when those fo- all Jesus' followers are going to be invited to the great marriage supper of the Lamb. Almost all of us have been to weddings before and weddings oftentimes can be solemn occasions for the ceremony part of it because during the ceremony these, these solemn vows are being exchanged between a man and a woman who are vowing to, to love and serve each other for the rest of their lives until death do them part. And you go through the solemnity and the beauty of that ceremony as the gospel is proclaimed through the union of two people, something that pictures the beauty of Christ and the church. But then the reception comes. And what do we do at the reception? We eat and we dance. And we have a fantastic time. And the Bible is telling us that that is what is going to happen for all of Jesus' followers at the great marriage supper of the Lamb when Christ brings his bride to himself and we experience a time of great joy and the victory and we give glory to the Lamb for all that he's done. So we see the fulfillment of the promise of joy there in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7. There is also a future fulfillment coming to this promise of deliverance. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 16 says this. This is, this is John having a vision and reporting this vision that he has. He says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Listen to the description of him. His eyes are a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems or crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. That's evoking that imagery we just saw of of garments that are no longer dipped in blood, that are no longer splattered in blood, that are rolled up in And thrown into the fire, but he is arrayed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Does that sound like the description of a champion? 
riding on a white horse, a robe dipped in blood, uh, uh, the, the sword proceeding from his mouth, treading the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. If there is anyone who can bring about the conditions of deliverance that our souls long and ache for, it is a champion with a, the array of a holy army of angels behind him. And that's the picture we have of our champion, the mighty God, the Messiah from the book of Revelation. The rod of the oppressor will be broken and the king will rule with his own rod of iron. But he is not going to rule as a tyrant because he is faithful and true. And he rules with truth and righteousness and justice. most certainly deliver his people as he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of who? The almighty God. A connection, once again, to the mighty God, the Messiah, the child champion. Okay. Revelation looks forward. In the third place, we, we see the fulfillment of the promise of safety. Listen to this vision of humanity flourishing that comes at the end of, the, of, of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1, John reports the vision that he sees of, of human flourishing as it has never been experienced before. He says in verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. This is, this is the city that's threatened by, uh, by uh, Ahaz feels is threatened. That's even had siege works laid against it. But he sees the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying this, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Isaiah speaks of Emmanuel, the with us God. And Revelation says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. That sounds pretty safe to me. Why will we be safe? The answer is because we will live with God mighty God, the champion God, the hero God. As Emmanuel, he is going to be with us. You and I will be safe from death, which we've prayed about with tears this morning as we mourn the people we've lost. You are going to be safe from death personally. We're going to be safe from sadness We're going to be safe from pain. We are going to be a people who no longer need to mourn. Because the Bible tells us those things have passed away. We use the euphemism of passing away to describe things that have died. John is describing a picture of the future in which... Death itself, sadness itself, pain itself, mourning itself will have died and be no more. And that ought to give us great hope for the future. For what our champion is one day going to do is he rides in on that white horse with his army behind him. You can see then why there were people who were disappointed with Jesus. Who doesn't want it now? But what about the here and now? 
because, because Matthew chapter 4 directly quotes Isaiah chapter 9 and says, this coming hero, this coming child champion, the, the son that to us is born, the child who's going to be given, he was born. And that's what we're separating Separating. That's what we're celebrating this month of December with all the things that we have going on. But what about these promises in the time between? Because we live between that first and second coming. We celebrate the baby who was born, the birth of the baby who was born in the manger. The child has been born, the son has been given. And yet we have not yet seen him riding in on that white horse to to put to death, death itself. But I believe that we can experience these three gifts of the mighty God in the time between the Advents. The three gifts that the mighty God, our hero, our champion, offers to us even living in the nitty-gritty details of our daily lives right now where there is pain and there is suffering and there is the threat of war and you could have a random shell hit your home and lose everything, even in this time, the New Testament presents a vision of the Messiah who gives us these things in the here and now. And I want to show you the present fulfillment of each of these three gifts. The first is the gift of... Of joy. When the angel appears to the shepherds on the hill that dark night, he says this to them in Luke chapter 2 and verse 10. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great what? Joy. That will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day. In the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Joy is not, we're going to talk about this in in a later message on this, but but joy is not an all or nothing proposition. Yes, right now there is mourning and tears and sadness and pain as we are not yet living in the reality of the fullness of our mighty God's kingdom. But the Bible presents a vision of the Christian life in which joy can be our present possession right now. Amidst the pain and amidst the mourning. In fact, one of the blessings that the Apostle Paul speaks over the Christian church in the book of Romans in chapter 15 and verse 13 is this. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy And peace in believing, so that by the power of the Spirit you may abound in hope. What the the Apostle Paul's wish for the Christian church then and now is that you and I could have the present experience of an abundance of hope. And we have that abundance of hope. We We have that joy that comes through what? What is the word? What is the word? It comes through believing. We like to to scratch out that word believing, and say, "I'll have joy and hope in," and we write in the conditions of which we can have hope. But we don't get to write in the conditions. We live in a in a time when there's still mourning and sadness, and yet the Bible presents for us. The fact that when we put our faith and our trust in Christ, we can have a present experience of a joy amidst the sorrow. Because the mighty God's coming. There is a second present experience that we can have, and that is the the present experience of deliverance. Isaiah had spoken a prophetic word that says, hey, that that yoke that you feel on your backs, that, that rod of oppression, that staff that has struck your back, throughout your history and continues to 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 threaten you now one day that rod and that staff and that that yoke is going to be broken one day almighty god is going to rule with his own rod of 
of iron with in righteousness and truth. But you and I can experience, and it can be your testimony if you are a follower of Jesus, that you have experienced a measure of deliverance in the present. People were disappointed with Jesus because he did not provide the physical deliverance that they had hoped for. And yet, what kind of deliverance has Jesus made for us? Jesus has delivered us from death. Jesus has provided a kind of deliverance that we desperately need, a deliverance from our sin. The Bible says this in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Jesus has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has provided a deliverance for us by being delivered up for us, Romans 4.25 tells us, being delivered up for our trespasses. What Jesus came to do in the first advent is every bit as significant as, the, as what will he will accomplish in the second. He gave himself, he was delivered up for our sins so that we could be delivered from the kingdom of darkness. Every single one of us without exception are card-carrying members at birth into the kingdom of darkness. We said last week that we are born into the kingdom of darkness, and though we are not as bad as we could be, thank God, we are contributors to the kingdom of darkness. But the Bible tells us the good news of the gospel is because that child champion was born, and because he lived out a perfect life fulfilling all righteousness, and because he was willing to be delivered up for your sins, my sins, you think about the sins of your life in word, in thought, in deed, even the things that you ought to have done that you failed to do, and you recognize that he allowed himself to be delivered up for every single one of those sins. Delivered over to the cross so that you could be delivered from the kingdom of darkness and transfer, transferred into his glorious kingdom. We still live in a world with the threat of war. But Jesus has accomplished the most miraculous deliverance for you that you could ever know. And friend, if you are here this morning and you are still a card-carrying member of the kingdom of darkness, boy, do we have good news for you. Jesus extends the gift of salvation to you this morning as a free gift. If you will repent of your sins and come to him in faith, he will in this moment transfer your citizenship. You will have walked into this auditorium a citizen of the kingdom of darkness and you will walk out a citizen of the kingdom of light. You don't even need a fancy invitation for that. You can bow your head and close your eyes and speak to God however you want right now and receive that. There's a gift of deliverance that can can be ours right now. But thirdly, you and I can experience a gift, a very real gift of safety. As I said, Revelation tells us about this champion child who's a hero. This hero rides on a white horse and makes war. This hero has eyes which are a flame of fire. This hero has a robe that is dipped in the blood of war. This hero wields a sharp sword that strikes down the nations. This hero treads the winepress of the wrath of God. I mean, when you hear all those descriptions strung together of this hero, it ought to be a little intimidating, right? I don't want to mess with that guy. I want to be on his team. (laughs) But the Bible also has a lot to say about the heart of this hero. And Jesus lets us understand the heart of the hero from his own mouth. Many of us read a book together this year based on this passage of scripture that reveals the heart of the hero. But it is found in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. 
The hero says this, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll tread out the winepress of God's wrath on you. Now, the heart of the hero says, come to me, all you who are labor laden, and I'll give you rest. You can trade out that yoke of bondage that you have felt. You take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Because the hero is gentle, and lowly in heart. And if you humble yourself, and you bow the knee to Jesus and you come to him in faith, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's so light it doesn't even feel like a burden at all. Did you come here today burdened? And with what? The hero says he's got a heart for people like you. That whatever it is that you walked in here today carrying, he wants you to be able to to know that you can come to him and you can give that burden to him. And no, it's not a promise that you're going to go home and you'll never feel the fear again. You'll never fear the mourning again, that you're not going to feel pain again. He's not promising that. What he is saying is that you can experience a measure of safety in the here and now, in the time between the advents. Because the hero has a heart. One day we are going to experience the joy of his presence. We saw earlier at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But right now, we get a taste of it the Lord's Supper. In the time between the Advents, as we come to the table of the Lord together this morning, one of the things that we want to do is celebrate the gifts that we've been given. Our hero has brought us joy. Our hero has delivered us from the bondage to sin and death. Our hero has brought us safety. And though this world is indeed full of danger, we are safe in Christ, who offers us rest, who offers us a table in the presence of our enemies.